All right, guys, we're back on the Next Level Agents podcast. And today, joined by my good buddy, uh, my friend, my business partner, uh, a dude I just I love, Mr. Bob Sophia of the New Home Collective in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. How's it going, brother? Man, gets better every day. I love hearing that, dude. Well, Bob, I'm glad you and I, uh, you and I talk a lot, like on the phone or here and there. Uh, we text, obviously, too. But I'm glad to like actually do a podcast with you where I kind of get to, I feel like finally I get to put you on the hot seat, bro. And I get to pepper you with questions. I feel like normally it's like we do a good job of going back and forth. And, you know, normally we're just catching up and, you know, shooting the shit or whatever. We do talk about business, but it's kind of, I'd be honest, man. I tell people all the time when they ask me about my podcast, what I love doing about it. And uh, the thing that I love is like this right here. I just get to, I get to question people in an awkward way, but because it's recorded, and published on a podcast, it's not socially awkward. So I'm excited to uh, to put you put you on the hot seat and put you to the test, dude. Okay, well I'm ready. So Bob, why don't we start this, dude? For the people that don't know you, give us give us your uh, your elevator speech. Who are you? Tell me a little bit about your team and how long you've been in business. Um, so about my team. Been in business. Uh, I was with Keller Williams for a while with the team. That's how I got got my start. Um, read the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book and didn't look back. Love it. I feel like I was the first one, the first person to have a fully functioning team in our market. Um, it, they, I call them legacy teams. The legacy teams were in place before I got started. You know, the mom and the son, or the mom and the daughter, and. You know, then they have a couple of people that run around and run errands for them and that type of thing. But to have a fully functioning team that that self-sufficient off of the income of the team, that that's something that I I pride myself on being one of the first ones that if not the front, I would argue that I was the first one to have that. It brought on its own challenges, you know, for and sure. over the years I've I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And um uh, uh, now the team uh we're we're up to I could, this is a funny question because I should know the answer to this, how many agents we have. We have 12 producing agents. So, you know, we, over time we've brought on agents that, you know, don't really do anything, you know, and I don't know nobody, what to do. Nobody like knows them. what you're talking about. Nobody's experienced that. I, I like them. I, <laughs> you know, they're, they're good people to me. Um, but over the past six months, I, I think the biggest thing with the team is, you know, there was like maybe six to eight months. We just got back into uh, getting deep in um, accountability. You know, um, you know, 2021 was the best year our team ever had. 2022, we we declined about $20 million. We went from $62 million to $42 million. Um, and then this year, we're back on track to hit 60. I, I mean, it's hard to project at this point. I know last month we were up 118%. We put 118% more pendings Whoa. down than we did the previous year. So just been grinding, grinding. What I love about you, I think one of the reasons why we get along is because you're, you're, you're always working on like the next level. Like you're always like, you know, at the last six months or the last three months, we hear some changes we've made and here's how it's starting to, to improve or here's where it's starting to work. I yeah. love that you're not, you're not afraid to tinker. You're not afraid to change things for the sake of getting better. To me, that means a lot. What, um, I'm going to go back a second. What year did you get licensed? 2012. 2012. Okay. So you've been, you've been in the game for, for a minute. Um, and then you mentioned the number of agents on your team. How many staff members on your team and count Blair? I want to talk about how Blair like is a, wanna... like a three times multiplier. Like oh, I'm, I'm aware. Literally does, I want she literally about... does the job of like four people, but then she also recently got a real estate license and could, and the reason why she got a real estate, this is important. She got a real estate license because someone, some agent out of a small town around here said that he wasn't going to talk to her because she wasn't an agent. She was an admin. She's been in the real estate business for like 22 years or something. Like, like so, so, I mean, she's so been besides, in longer than anybody I know. Besides Blair, how many staff members do you have? So we have her and in, uh, in office, we have her, we have uh, Madison, who's like my integrator, like 
the guys, everything to me. But uh, and then we have um, uh, Brittany, uh, who's a inside sales. She does inside sales. And okay. then we have five international employees. Okay, so you, that's a pretty good size staff. So uh, Blair, for the record, is uh, Bob's better half, both in life and in business. Yeah, for sure. Um, what I love is, so like you mentioned, she's been in real estate for a long time. She's been in and around it for a long time. And I distinctly remember, dude, that uh, now you, you honestly, you understand sales and running sales businesses at a really high level, like more so than most people I've, I've run across. But I distinctly remember when Blair came into your business. Now she's like an operational wizard. And the- She doesn't say that. She doesn't think that at all. Well, of course she doesn't think that, uh, but <laughs> I can see it from the outside, dude. And yeah. I know that you feel it too. I just yeah. saw the impact that she made on your business. And it was a, to me, it's a game. Now you're lucky because Blair's, your, you're married. So you're lucky. However, the story that I want to tell here, or this, the thing that the nugget that I think is important is having somebody at that high of a caliber who understands the operational side of the business the, when you marry the two together, like, you know, business-wise, like that's how you really get to grow and experience new heights in your business. We like each other too. It helps. We like each other. We like spending time together. I mean, we like spending time together. We forgive each other real quick because we definitely get on each other's nerves sometimes. But as far as business goes, yeah, I could never afford her though. <laughs> never be able to afford her. I would never be able to afford her. Like, I mean, it's bad advice to give to someone, I, you know, say, find someone like her. I don't know if that's, I mean, it took me a long time to recruit her. I mean, the hardest, most difficult, longest term recruiting process involved in my business ever, like not just business, but personal. Like it was, it was, uh, I definitely saw that I saw her in the business, but even after we got married, she wasn't in the business. She was still, um, working, working for KW. So, well, for me, that's a story or a lesson of like, number one, always be recruiting. And just because you might not be ready for somebody in your business today, or they might not be ready for you. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't be playing the long game with talented people right now. Right. You got to recruit her personally first to be your wife. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was, you know, one thing to overcome. And then yeah, I know, cause I was there like on, on the sideline watching you, yeah. Um, you, when you recruited her work wise too, like that was a whole other like process. And even if she had been an employee and someone you were writing a check to versus like your partner in life, um, she'd have been worth it because the impact that she's had you, and you saw yeah. that long before it came, it came to fruition. And I, I think the important thing here is that, um, you understood that there was a level uh, another level on the administrative side or the operational side of the business that you didn't have that, um, that she did that you were able to bring in. And I would say just uh, to speak on myself, like leadership wise, like it's, it was, a, it was a challenge. It has been a challenge. I mean, I feel like now her and I like click, like we got a really good thing going, but like, I mean, if you can imagine, like, if so, like, if my vision isn't clear, like if my plans aren't clear or if my plans come into question, someone as intelligent as her, that's my wife. Like, like I have to be really clear in the moments when I'm like kind of fuzzy, like she shuts down, she shuts down. She's like, you know, it's helped me clarify and simplify and, and, um, and hold things together because I've had to, I've had to, especially through that, that, especially through 22, 22 was crazy. Like twenty million dollars less in sales is a, that's an adjustment that, in a business that type of revenue to go from, this to this just you know top line revenue to go away, over the period of twelve months. I mean, how do you adjust for that? And how do you adjust for that not just financially, but in the home with your wife and with your people and with, and keep going, like, the the thing we were talking about today was a. Uh, adaptive persistence. Like that's the thing that I have that I, that's the thing that I have that I feel is like one of my str biggest strengths. Like you had hit on it, but like how important that is with my wife. You know, I, I always say this one thing to her is like, 
or what I've had to say through the, through the struggles or through the, through the days that were a little tougher than others is like, like I'm carrying this weight. Like there's no reason for both of us to carry it. Right. And that, that gets blended when you are in business partnership or in marriage with someone, I think a lot of times, you know, and it's not that I don't want to share with her what I'm going through, but like, there's no reason for her to worry about what I'm handling. Right. And I think that a lot of people do that, whether it's people they work with their business or like life, you know, like I got this weight. I'm carrying this weight already. I don't need, I don't need your help carrying this. I need your help carrying this. Right. So that's been a, a big moment for me, like getting that clear on that and being able to set those boundaries with, or I guess you would call stress or anxiety or thinking about things that could go wrong or <laughs> like the challenges that we're in. Would you looking back on it now, the adjustment that you've probably, you guys have had to make and you know, in working, actually starting to work together. What advice would you give someone else who maybe there's a, maybe the wife is the rainmaker and the husband works at another job or, or the other, maybe, or the other way around. Um, and the, the rainmaker sees their spouse as ta- like true talent that could improve their business. Um, what, what would you say to that person now, knowing what you know now? Look, this is something I picked up at one of your masterminds in, in Arizona when uh, Frank was there. Frank, he's got a way of like simplifying things. Like when he, like some of the stuff he said, like have changed my life, like seriously that clear. But what he was talking about was VAs, right? And his, his house buying business. And it's something that I've thought about a lot over the period of my life is like, like, you know, you've got these people that work with you and it's like, how do they win? They want to know how to win. They want to do their best. They want to do their best. They want to be their best. They want to do the best for you. They want to do the best for the people they work with. But unless you're really crystal clear on what everyone's specific role is, I see this the most. I'm so good at spotting problems in other people's businesses. It's a little more challenging to see them in my own. But what I see is like that generalist. And that's what he talked about when he was talking about how he trained this VA team to buy houses in other states that he never steps foot in. Like how he organized that and how he organized his whole organization on that org chart, but how, also how he trained them and he set the expectations for each person's positions and how that creates an unfair advantage in business, right? But I think about, I think about international employees a lot. I think about their strengths, their weaknesses, how, how much they've affected my life how annoying they can be to me sometimes, you know, the language barriers and uh, the difference in their personalities and all that. But I'm just going to bring that back to my relationship with my wife and my relationship with my business and the relationship with the people around me is that if, if I'm not crystal clear on those expectations or on, on what they need to expect themselves or their position, or like, if I'm not crystal clear on that, well, how can, how can they win? How can they be successful and how can they grow if they don't know the clarity on what that is? So I'm constantly working towards that. It's constantly like, and, and I don't want to, like, it's not that I micromanage. It's like, it's like, cause you got to let people create that and discover that themselves, but like the boundaries of the expectations for each person and it's making it to the point that, well, that no one becomes a generalist. No one is more important than the business, which happens in a lot of people's businesses. Like you got one person that does everything. Well, that person holds you hostage, like whether it's your wife or whether it's whoever it is, but my wife does, does have me hostage. I, I could never leave her ever. I don't, I could, wouldn't be able to survive without her. Right. But in the business, in we're kind of getting into this now with her because I mean, in nine weeks or in eight weeks, she put nine properties under contract in eight weeks, just, just in the spare time. Well, mind you, we put 26 deals under contract as a team and, you know, took 15 or 16 lists. I think it's 15 listings and had, you know, 18 closings. And she put eight contracts, uh, properties under contract in nine weeks. So I'm like, hold on a second. Like is the most effective use of her time 
doing the contract to close in the in the listing man i mean is that the best place for her like i'm gonna go ahead can... and answer this for you the answer is no <laughs> right? that's what i'm saying so, so on it but she could train someone she's talented enough to spot somebody who could do that job as well as she could it take two or three people yeah it would take it, it would maybe there is one person out there that could do it but you know that emotional intelligence or that like the piece of it, the the critical thinking and all the things she does um, that you can't train somebody to do. Like yeah. that's, well, I mean, I guess that's the challenge of all business owners is that no one can do it as good as you, right? Like that's what everybody gets into that place where it's like, okay, well, I got to do it because no one can do it as good as me, right? So that's kind of a look inside of what, I think that answers the question, right? Or yeah. did it? Totally. Maybe. <laughs> uh, and if not, that's okay. But I, I think it answers. Yeah. It. Let me ask you this. So you just talked about, you know, down here last year, back up this year, you know, recovering. What's the, if I said to you, Hey, what are the two or three things that have made all the difference in kind of getting back to that point this year and making up the ground you lost last year? What are they? Through the period. Okay. So I mean, my new way you know this and everyone else that runs a real estate business should knows this, that the two most expensive things are leads and people, right? Yeah. Like, and then when you come into a downturn and you come into a different market, what is it? You get rid of your people or you get rid of your leads? You know, like, you, I mean, what do you get rid of? Cause all the rest of the stuff doesn't cost anything compared to what you're paying them for leads and what you're paying for people. Right. So that being said, like I just had to keep going and stayed focused on Google reviews, stayed focused on putting content out there, stayed positive and stayed. I carried a weight. Like I said, I carried this weight, carried this weight to show you my balance sheet. Like, I mean, I, I carried a weight. Like I do have other businesses and other ways to generate income, but I carried a weight. But, but now what I've done over that period of time, I, 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 I the main thing I did, the, the biggest thing I did and what's finally coming into play, you know, I consider everything to have a six month cycle, everything I do, like I can't expect results for six months, right? Right. But I switched from being totally prospecting based to being marketing based, you know, like instead of being like all about prospecting, because that's what I've been since the very first day, like training everybody to make calls, which I still do. I still do that. And I still, you know, I've gotten really focused on the accountability of that and what it takes, how many nurtures or database ads it's going to take for you to generate, you know, three listings a month and what it's going to take. And, you know, if you're going to put in the work, this is what you're going to have to do. And you're going to have to get your skills up, you know, getting away from it more of being a numbers game, but being more skills. But I've really focused on the marketing part and making the phone ring. And I've gotten into the ISA model where I always had ISA, I've had ISA since the very beginning, but they were always outbound. They were always set in listing appointments, which, you know, I'm pretty good at. But the part that I didn't have was that inbound person watching the cash register, you know, and that's made a huge change. And I, I, I shifted my splits a little bit to make, to make, make it so that the inbound leads, the company makes money on <laughs> like, duh, the prospect, the self prospecting lead, the leads that the agents prospect, I still have all the best tools in my market, probably close in the country, like as far as prospecting goes, like if you want to prospect for business, come work with us. Like I got, I have it all right. That I raised the splits on, which incentivized them to do more prospecting. And then I created a, 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 a split on the sphere of influence or agent business, you know, so I can bring in a seasoned agents now and I have a graduated split for their database, right? Their database deals make a graduated split first year, second year, third year in the third year being 75, 25. You can't run a business at 70. There's not a person that's ran a real estate business. If you told them they could have a 75% profit margin on their business, like it's impossible. It's impossible to be profitable if you're paying that much, right? Like, unless you don't have any services yep. but without cutting the service. So We've been able to blend those two models together and make it And the productivity of the agents has gone through the roof. It's gone crazy. Everybody's doing, everybody's in the game. What's interesting is I think a lot of people would have gone 
maybe more the other way. People that were more marketing based might have gone more prospecting based. What so what I what I'm hearing or kind of taking away from this is like you went, okay, what we were doing, it was, you know, good enough for what it was. But if we wanted to add more, then we needed to actually add more. And in your case, you that meant that meant marketing. You meant I've yep. got to go add my marketing in addition to my prospecting. Cause if I just keep with just prospecting, I'm going to, I'm going to probably only improve incrementally. Whereas if I'm going to go and get back and improve by, in this case, like, dude, this is a 50%. If you go back, that's, that's a 50% improvement year over year. Assuming you, you stay on pace through the end of this year, that's a big, yeah. big improvement. And I think yeah, we've, that, that's important. And compared to our market, we're outpacing our market by like 30%. So like now, if we, if we look at that, like the market's going down, we're going up. Like there's been some major shifts in our business and that's, that's been a big one. And the other piece of it was, is I've also learned that like the prospecting based thing is dependent on other people. Like it depends on other people, right? Like me getting the phone to ring is dependent on me. When someone calls and says, we want to list our house, they call because I got them to call me. <laughs> like, I mean, that's facts. So I've just taken on a little more responsibility when it comes to that. And, um, but the prospecting thing, we're still like, we're still like prospecting like crazy. Like we still, we're still pounding the phones. We're still making a couple thousand phone calls every day. Like we're still, we're still adding people to our database every single day through prospecting. So the other thing was, is the phone filters. Like that was a big challenge that happened right about the same time COVID came in. Like my brain, my brain started going, Oh gosh, what am I going to do? I'm not going to be dependent on this, you know, spam filters. I got blacklisted. My email got blacklisted or whatever they call it, where I send an email to my wife and it goes to her spam filter because of my name. You know, like that happened to me, you know, like all these things that are happening, those things, I guess you do have a little bit of control, but I just wanted to flip the script on it. And it's now, now putting us back in the game, put us back in the game. What would you say? So I, first of all, what you're telling me about having a down year last year, not uncommon. Most, most of the fairly successful teams I know, or teams I would consider cons successful, had a down year last year compared to the previous couple of years. Um, and I know just from talking to people, a lot of people are down again this year. You're not, you're improving. What would you, what would be your advice to someone else who's maybe going through it this year? Like this is their down year. This is the year where they're, they're seeing a decline and they're, they're in that phase of like, man, I got to figure this out. What's your advice to those folks? I'm always looking outside of my space. Like, like my awareness to my awareness is deep. Like I go, I go, but it's real simple for me. My process of awareness is I look to places that are further ahead than we are. Like I see other markets like your market, like San Diego. I look to these other markets that are, people are setting trends. The competition there is much higher. People are doing stuff in these other markets, like years before our markets doing them. So I just grab onto that. I just grab on, I latch onto that. My biggest thing has been Google reviews. I mean, I think that that sets us in a different way. Look, number one, we're number one by hundreds of reviews in the state of Kentucky. We have 897 or something. We're getting ready to hit 900 Google reviews. When yeah. somebody calls us up, and that's been a game changer along with Google local services ads because I can pick any market in the whole state that I want. Somebody says top real estate agent in, uh, in any city, Jamestown, Kentucky. And we come up, especially in the smaller markets, like, but in the, even in the bigger markets, there's people that can't compete with us because they have uh, 20 reviews or a hundred reviews. And we've got 900 as a team. So like taking that, taking that and making that like, you know, people call in and they're like, look, we were looking for someone that was experienced that had some good uh, credibility and some, some uh, track record. We picked you like, come list me. I'm like, okay, here we go. Like that's, that would be a big piece. I would focus on I've, but I focused on my online presence since I started the first day I got put on probation at Remax. They put me on probation. Like my first three months, the sales manager, not even the owner, she came in and she came in and she said, or he said, 
He said, Bob, the owner, she wanted me to let you know that you're on probation. And if you don't get into production within the next 30 to 90 days, we're going to let your license go. They did this to me. They know they did it too. They know it. They know it. They know it. They get to look at the numbers. They get, they know what happened. They put me on probation for production. But the reason why is because I was focused on my online presence. I was focused on my I am statements. I was focused on my, you know, bios and my connectivity between all the different websites that I could connect to for free, you know, and now it's starting to pay off. But that was since 2014 or 2012, 2012 is when I got my license. So I've been working on that every day. So I'm hearing, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, the advice you're giving someone may or may not be Google reviews, but it's go out and, and like, you got to like focus on something and you've got to add something to your business. If you're going, if it's going to improve, you can't just keep yeah, doing like, what you're doing. Right. And not to overcomplicate it, but like, you know, people are now they're doing research. This is the opposite of me prospecting into your living room when you're eating lunch, right? I call, you say, Oh, I was looking for a real estate. I, was, I needed a real estate agent. And you call that this is perfect. I was praying somebody would call me. That's different than how that does still happen. We're still doing that. We're still getting into people's living rooms through the phone and calling for sale by owners and calling expired. That's still going on. But what I'm saying is, is that people, you know, in Zillow, I think Zillow is the, the culprit to this whole thing. It's like not culprit. It's not even culprit. That's the wrong word. Like they're the ones that have empowered people to do research and become experts before they ever even reach out to a real estate agent. They're still hiding behind their computer, you know, Googling stuff and checking people out. And if your link to your website doesn't work because you didn't take the extra HTTP out of it, or you didn't, it doesn't go to your Facebook page, it goes to a dead page because you didn't add in the, the right, that's what people see. And that those attentions to that detail, it's just, this is my advice, Google yourself. <laughs> Cause that's how people are doing business. They're Googling. Google yeah. yourself and what comes up. Dude, that's You'd, be great amazed. Point. You'd be amazed. Yeah. The go, things I see. Go look and see, try to see it, not through the way you see it. Go try to see it through the way the consumer sees you. Yes. And I take it as far as to say, like with the agents that come in here, I'm like, okay, if you're, if you're, instead of like posting into a referral group that you're looking for an agent in Phoenix, Arizona, pretend like your mother's going to move there. And your mother, think about all the things about your mom. Find someone that matches with her, but do it by looking at people's profiles. Like, where do you start? Like, how are you going to find a person? If you were a consumer and you're going to look for someone, or look for yourself or look for some, looking for yourself is a little bit different because you're a real estate agent. But if you were your mother, you're looking for your mother. You're not going to, you're not going to refer them to somebody based on someone else's like, like, or love of this person. You're going to do it based on track record and experience and on personality and on all these things that you want to match with your mother. Right. That's how you got to look at it. You got to look at it like that. Not like, not like, uh, that's how you got to look at yourself. You, I mean, that's what I'm saying. You got to look at yourself. Like how do I become that person that, that owns that space that other people want to connect with? Yeah. That like, goes that my client, that my ideal client or my avatar, if you will, wants to, to do business with. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. I, I love that. I think, um, just seeing you persevere and, and the way you've grown your business, um, the way you've, the way you fought through things, uh, through growth stages is it's just been awesome. Um, and you know, your sort of your message of continuing to grow, which what's the word you used at the beginning, like persevere and what, uh, grow, was it adaptive persistence? adaptive persistence. I think that is like, that speaks to me. That's going, yeah. Hey, I'm not stuck and married to the way it has to be. Right. Um, so I'm willing to adapt to what's going on in the marketplace, what's going on trend wise. And yet I'm still persistent. So I'm not giving up. Like I'm going to continue down this road, even if it means I've got to kind of zig and zag. Right. You have to, you have to, you don't have a choice. It's like, I've had people call me a tech. No, it's people say you're a tech. I'm not a techie at all. Like, in fact, it's one of the least favorite things I have to do is troubleshoot electronics. Yeah. But, but 
I've learned out of survival. Like there's things you have to do to survive. There's a, adaptations you have to make. My grandfather, he would, before he passed away, he would, he never sent an email in his whole life. But I said, you don't have to. That's not, for him to survive, he didn't have to. But for me, I have to know all the shortcuts. I have to know the, the most effective ways to send emails and the best uh, uh, subject lines and the best way to ask a question at the end so people don't just let the email go away. The best time of day to send it. I got to know everything to survive, not to be techie or to be just part of life. You got to gotta dig, you got to change, you got to persevere. Yeah, that's dude, that's solid. I love that. Persevere. I think that's the message that we need right now. Um, that a lot of, a lot of us need right now, you know, coming into, we're in the third quarter, 2023, um, things are challenging out there for a lot of people based on the conversations I'm having and perseverance really is one of the, one of the key messages that I think people have got to really, um, adopt and, and, and realize like we're, we're in a phase of perseverance. Like you've got to be able to do that. You don't lose unless you quit. Yeah. Just can't quit. Gotta keep going. It's a war of attrition. And uh Gotta keep going. Only lose you're right. You only lose if you quit. The a title guy that we work with, our favorite, the land group, this guy Aaron Marsh, special, special dude. Like literally, I could call him any time of day. Even if he wasn't close, he'd probably answer my call. That's how he's amazing. Uh, but he calls me up the other day and he says, Look, man, I'm so excited for you guys and your business. Why do you think your business is growing and everybody else is getting out of business? Because all I hear is people's negative talk about real estate right now. So he asked me, why is your business growing and everyone else is complaining about it? And I, this is what I believe in my heart is that part of our business is, I mean, I, I do work every day at it and the people around me are pushing hard, right? But I believe part of our business getting better is the people that are quitting. That has a little bit to do with it. Maybe not a lot, but it has a little bit to do with it. The people that are the people that are listening to they're in a place where they're they're hearing things or they're they've already decided in their brain that they're done and they quit. But, you know, however many deals, it adds up to two deals a month for us. One deal a month. It, I, uh, it does something for our business. I agree with that. I think um, when I look at, I, I, I've had this conversation multiple times with with a lot of people in the last couple of weeks. I think, I think it's true in real estate in our business. I think this is true in um, other industries. I think it's true in investing. Is that in a time like this where it's hard, and people focus on the negative and they're sort of like down on their luck or whatever people get out. Um, and sometimes in a bad market, you can actually not grow. And that is growth. You could actually stay kind of stagnant, but if everybody else is going backwards, your market share improves. And as things quote unquote, get better, I'm not a big fan of using that word to describe it, but as the market gets better or changes, what happens is because you stayed where you were or even grew a little bit, maybe not as fast as you wanted to, and everybody else went backwards, the gap actually just gets bigger as things start to get easier for everyone. And right. uh, there, so that is, yeah, that's a hundred percent accurate. I believe. I believe that's why we've been focused. That's why the market share focusing on that. I mean, that's something I think I picked up from KW, but you know, looking at the market compared to what we're doing, we've been doing a lot of that. Like that's good. You know, because it's one way that you can add positivity to something that may not be as positive as you want it to be. Right. Like if you understand. Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I a hundred percent believe that. Um, you know, I go back to, uh, I'll, I'll sort of end with this story just to kind of illustrate this point when I got, I got licensed in 07. So market was already just total shit here. Right. Um, yeah. I, and I was at, I started at KW. And, um, I remember 07, 08, 09 KW was like, they were growing, but like a little bit, um, and not like they weren't growing by leaps and bounds. 
But what happened was, is the rest of the industry, most of the other big, especially like the companies in like, say the top 10, and especially the ones in front of them, they were going backwards in agent count. They were getting smaller. KW right. was growing that fast, but they were growing and not going backward. And so what happened is as the market shifted and as things got better for the whole industry, it, K, KW just like, they lapped everyone. They just sort of catapulted. And it was yeah. like, but why? Because they were able to maintain. So even when it looked from the outside, like they weren't growing, what was happening is they really were, they were growing their market share. It just didn't become obvious until later. Now things have changed for them and it's gone the opposite way. And we're, I'm not necessarily here to talk about that today, but if you just go back at that time, that time in history, that was right. happening. And I remember distinctly watching that happen. Uh, and, you know, it's part of like, I look at, you know, our, you and I are both, uh, you know, agents at EXP Realty and I look at EXP and we're not growing as fast as we used to be growing. Of course, we're significantly bigger now too than when you and I joined, but I'm going like, when I look at the rest of the big hitters, like the big companies in the country, that most of them are going backwards. Uh, right. So even just going forward a little bit is actually a massive win because yeah. things shift back and they will, they'll shift another direction in the future. And it'll be like, everybody wants to get a license again. Like we'll, we'll be off to the races. Right. Right. So even though it might not always look like you're winning because it just doesn't feel like you're winning enough. The truth is you are because other people are losing and they're losing sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but they're going, they're going the opposite. They're going the wrong direction. So yeah, I think that's, yeah. an, I think that's an excellent point, Bob. Yeah. Well, dude, this is fun. I always love being able yeah. to hang out and chat with you. If anybody wants to like catch up with you or kind of follow what you're doing, you know, where's the best place? Is there like a Facebook page or an Instagram page for people to follow? Yeah. Um, at NHC now, like, wait, real quick about that. It used to be 411 Lex, which I've never had to restate ever one time. Did someone say 411 LEX? I, no, I didn't have to say it. But NHC now was my version of being able to get out of my market. New Home Collective, NOW, NHC. So I always have to spell it out for people like New Home Collective, NHC, NOW. Got so it. at NHC, NOW, those are all the company pages, but through the company pages, you'll be able to connect with mine. Awesome. Well, Bob, you know that I love you, brother. I uh, love talking shop with you and yeah. just catching up. And thanks for taking the time to kind of to kind of share your story and uh, what's working for you with our, with our listeners today. I feel good about it. I feel well, good about it. All right, guys. Uh, Till next time, we will uh, we'll see you then. That's it for today.